Prog is a domain-specific language for composing Turing machines. It gives us a unique opportunity for CS420 students to study complex problems that are uh, in theoretical computer science, hopefully in an intuitive framework. So all the theorems studied in this course are fully proved, and you can go through them in your, at your own pace, interactively. You can know exactly why everything works the way it works, why proofs uh, make sense. So all the details are, are in the book, up to a certain level of detail, as you will see. Um, I do try to write all the proofs in the, in the Turing library to follow as closely as possible the structure of the book. Sometimes, as you will see in other lessons, I mentioned this in, in one of another lesson, is that the book kind of short, takes a shortcut and is very brief on certain proofs. And, and in our, and if you actually peruse the um, Turing library, you will see the proof step by step without any detail elided. So hopefully you, you will go through at least a few of the proofs. Uh, try to do it at least for the most interesting ones, such as the halting problem. Another thing I wanted to point out is that the this Turing project is a research project that actually originated from trying to teach CS420 in a my attempt of trying to teach CS420 in a more compelling way. My objective was to try to make CS420 project based to augment the interactive interactiveness of the course and the material, and also to let students be more autonomous. By giving them a proof assistant, they have their own TA that can work for them at any time without uh, having to bother anyone. They, you get an actual result. Does this work? You can try it yourself and ask the proof assistant and it will tell you yes or no. So this semester, we are actually pushing the state of the art of how we teach theoretical computer science. So I'm really interested in your input and things that you think were too light or were in too much detail or actually needed more detail. So if you have any of those um, ideas or any kind of feedback, please contact me. I'm very interested in knowing what your, what your interest is, what our ideas. Uh, and also, if you want to contribute to the project, I'll be very happy to do to include you. Um, I will actually, at the end of closer to the end of the semester, I will create uh, a quiz, an anonymous quiz, where you can add some some questions if you don't want to do it uh, by email. So, what is a proc, a program, a Turing program, as I will henceforth call it? So, a Turing program program can be one of three things. So very simple domain-specific language. So it could be a sequence of two programs where we run one program and if the program terminated, we are able to continue to a second program and we are also able to know whether or not the first program either accepted or rejected. We may not observe whether the first program looped because that would break the theory. So you are, the continuation cannot know whether the first program looped. Because if you think about it, if you write two functions and the first function loops, how could the second function know? Because it never actually runs, right? So that is why if the first program uh, loops, there's nothing, you never reach the execution of the second program. This is sequential execution after all. The other functionality is the, abil the ability to run a Turing machine. So you can run a, a given any Turing machine that you want with a specific input, any input that you want. And when you run it, the whole thing may loop, right? And, and then the whole thing loops. If the machine loops, then the whole thing loops. If the machine accepts or rejects, you can then compose it with sequencing, as I show you in one, in, in our lessons. So the other thing we can do as well is we can write a program that simply returns, right? So we can just say, my because this is a result, we can just say, I want to write a Turing machine that always accepts. It accepts all inputs or it rejects all inputs or it um, loops forever for any kind of input. It always loops, right? So we basically have these three constructors that we can use 
to compose Turing machines. And with that, we are able to write all the theorems that are in the book. All the theorems that I, that I cover in this course. There is one more that we don't, that I'm not showing you here, which is the parallel execution of two, of two, uh, Turing programs. And this, I leave, um, I leave this discussion to when I introduce it in the lesson because you won't need it for the homework. And this is a more focused disc uh, discussion for the homework seven. So in the book, in the book, in the um, slides, in our lessons, in our lectures, uh, I will use the following three notations. There is MLET, which is simply sequencing uh, program one with pro program two, and as I mentioned before, you are able to access the result of whether P1 terminates. And that is given by this second parameter, which is just a function. It takes the result of P1 and then executes P2. You can just use the MLET notation for that. So if you see MLET, um, that is equivalent to C, SUQ. And when you search for MLET, you should just search for SUQ. So whenever you want to search MLET search S U E Q. So the next three things you will see is that accept in all capitals, reject and loop all in uppercase, right? So what does that re correspond? That's just the program for returning accept or returning reject or returning loop. So pretty simple. If you see all these all in caps, that's what it means. Okay, next, what I want to introduce is okay, I'm going to follow the same structure of the fundamentals that I showed you in the previous video. So I'm going to first introduce what is running, then what is recognized, what is recognizable, what is decides, what is decidable, and so on. Okay, so let's start with running. So running, we have this, this inductive definition of run. So notice the capital R. What we're saying is we're explaining what, what it is to run a program, a Turing program. So if I am just returning R, a result, that is the same as running and returning R, right? The other example is, the second constructor is, so second constructor is, if I want to call a machine with a certain input, that is the same as calling function run, and that is to say, run this Turing machine I, and then I get some result, that's going to be the result I'm going to return with this constructor. So that is another way of saying, if you have a run in your hypothesis that is the same thing if you do an inversion you would get this run okay and in fact i will show you this in the following video okay and then you have two more constructors to build run objects one is they're both for sequencing and if you think about it you need two because of what could p do well p could do one of two things either it terminates or it loops if it terminates, then it returns a Boolean, right? Which says true if R1 is accept or false if R1 is reject, right? So here we're running P, the result is R1. And if we are, and if R1 halts, which is what this deck is saying, decidable, um, then B is either true or false, which means I pass this Boolean to Q and now I can use Q to continue execution. And the execution of the continuation is R2. So the whole thing returns R2, right? So if, what is the other thing that could happen? The other thing that could happen is that P loops. And if P loops, the whole thing loops and Q never runs. It's a very simple rule. Okay, so we have two of these rules and we will see basically the homework assignment will ask you to either, as usual, either you have to construct elements of run, of type run, or you have to use, simplify things that are in, in your assumptions that are type uh, run, and you want to prove something using that knowledge. So in Coq, how do you specify that? Well, you specified with the, the following four rules. I hope by now you can read them. Next, what I want to do is just answer a few possible questions, which is 
why do I even re need P run and pro probes, programs or Turing programs? The basic idea that I want to try to convey is that having a program being inductively defined, unlike a Turing machine where it's unspecified, we don't really know what it, what it is. So we don't, we cannot reason about its structure. A program, because it was just inductively defined, we always know what are all the possibilities. So we can do proofs about any kind of composition of Turing machines, which is very powerful. It allows us to do the proofs that we have in the book. And then, so we can, we can think about all the possible ways in, in which we can construct a program, right? Declare a certain program. And the other thing is, is because we have defined inductively what it is to run, uh, then we can reason about all possible ways in which we could run a Turing program, okay? In which we could compose a Turing machine, right? So this is a very powerful idea because that allows us to reason about the composition of Turing machines. Thirdly, we need program because programs are being declared in the book. So if, if I, let me show you one. Actually, it's way further ahead. Section four. So what is a program? Almost. It's this. So basically, whenever you see a description like this, with the quotation marks, that is what the program is trying to represent formally. So it's just a way to formalize what is currently being informally described in the book. And this is known as the meta theory because it's theory about the theory. <laughs> Um, so with, so why would you want to use progs rather than run? Well, because it allows you to do easier proofs. As you, you will see, we will have an equivalent for recognizes decidable, decidability and recognizability for programs rather than machines, which allows, uh, you to do easier proofs. So less technicalities and idiocracies. Um, so it's, it's nicer. So just take my word for it. Okay, so then what will you need to use? And this is now, now is very relevant, relevant to your homework. And I will, after this video, we'll show you, we'll go through a few examples and then I will go through all the homework exercises. So first thing I need to introduce is P recognizes. So this is very, it's, it's analogous to recognizes, right? But now instead of machines, we have programs. So we're saying that a program P recognizes a language. That is to say, we have to use running of a program rather than running of a machine. And if the running returns accept, that happens if and only if the language accepts the, the input. What do you need to use to build a P recognizes? You need to use P underscore def. Um, and then for recognizable, and this is an important detail, is that there is no P recognizable. There's only recognizable because recognizable talks about languages. It doesn't talk about specific programs. So what, what does exist is P underscore recognizable, which takes a machine and builds, and builds a recognizable, right? Rather than taking, sorry, takes a program rather than a machine to show that a language is recognizable. So what is P decides? P decides is just showing that you have to show two things. You have to show that the program recognizes the language and then that the program is a decider. So recognizability, we already covered. So what is a decider? A decider is just something that for all inputs, P of I halts. Okay. So what is P halts? P halts is given a, a program there exists some um, result such that the result loops. Let me just double check this. Right, yes, okay. Yeah, so to be able to show that something exists, you just need to show that by running that program, the result is not loop. And there's also a, a, a subtlety here, which is to say 
that when you run something, there is this only a single input, right? If we think about it, before when we were running a Turing machine, right, the way to run a Turing machine is you run it with a function, right? So you give it a machine, you give it an input, the result is just a, a result R. If you call two, two times a function with the same inputs, the values must be the same. And the same thing is true for the run construct. So the run construct, if you give it two programs, you will get this. If you get two programs and the same two programs and the two programs are the same, that is to say, if you have P, uh, what is, if you are running program P and you get R1, and then if you run program P again and you get R2, you can conclude that R1 equals R2 is what I'm trying to say. So that is to say, you only need to show that there exists some result because all other results will be the same, right? And that is why this existential is there. So the way you show that P is, P halts is by showing that its result is not loop. Okay. Finally, what is P decidable? Again, P decidable is on languages. So you, you don't have a predicate like a, a definition p decidable what you have is p decidable def that is what you need to use if you want to use a program to show that a language is decidable so to summarize you will have the notion of p run which is this run with a capital r you have the notion of p recognizes which is given by p recognize and it's akin to recognizes of a machine for a language and then recognizable is the same, decidable is the same, and then we introduce p decides and p decider, and you have the constructors for all of this. And now, for running, you actually have constructors, and for that, I recommend you to do a print run or re remember these rules, which are explained in the previous slides. Right. So these are the four ways in which you can use to construct a run object. So they are the constructors, right? They are the constructors here. Okay, so in the next video, we're gonna go through a few examples. And then in the following video, we're gonna go through the exercise of the homework.